Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so today uh, we're pleased to have Johan Veslin uh, from Gothenburg. He's just going to tell us about the uh, replica symmetry method and combinatorial optimization. Thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is what I call the mean field model of distance, which is a random model where we have a, a complete graph on n points. And uh, for each pair of points, there's a number which we can think of as a distance or a weight or a length of the edge, costs of buying the edge, maybe. Um, <clears throat> so you should imagine that there is a non-negative real number uh, written on each of these edges. Um, and I will assume that these are identically distributed and independent but they have some, some kind of distribution uh, which can be, well, some different distributions. Say uh, uniform 0, 1 to begin with. And then, um, <clears throat> so this is what's called quenched disorder in physics. So we have some fixed random uh, disorder and then you would like to solve some optimization problem, find some ground state energy or whatever. So uh, the, the problems that I'm going to talk about are all of this form that I want to minimize the total length of an edge set that satisfies some criteria. For instance, um, the minimum spanning tree. This is a problem of this form. Uh, or maybe perfect matching, which would require a number of vertices to be even. I just want to pair them up and so on. Uh, the TSP, of course. Um, and for each of these problems, I just look at the, the feasible solutions and I pick the one where the sum of the edge weights are smallest. I um, also have the true factor, which is a, a relaxation of the TSP, where we require each vertex to have two edges, but there can be uh, disjoint cycles. Um, also, uh, one of my favorites which I mentioned in yesterday's teaser, uh, edge cover. So I want each vertex to have at least one edge. But unlike matching, I, can, I allow for, for several edges from the same vertex. So, um, so this differs from the first four problems in the sense that um, the number of edges in a solution, in the optimum solution, is dependent on the sample. Uh, so in this case, it could be anything from three to five, if I have six vertices. Uh, <coughs> okay, um, so there's something called the replica method, which originated in physics. And uh, um, it's a bit difficult to to understand what, what the replica symmetric ansatz really is. But it, so it's not, it doesn't seem to be based on some uh, reasonable assumptions that can be verified. It, so it's just a formal thing. Uh, so what I claim here is that this uh, ansatz will be justified in some cases that I will show you here. But uh, it's a little bit difficult to, to say really what, what that means. Um, so anyway, but I will look at um, the optimum solution for a large number of points. Um, and uh, some, some background here. So I'm not going to say very much about it. So a number of physicists have been looking at uh, matching and TSP and also some other problems. And uh, they have been, they, we're able to obtain some quite spectacular but non-rigorous results um, that were sort of tested and, well, people agreed that they must be true, but the method was not 
rigorous. Um, also, I mentioned in, in this context, but this is much later, but also uh, it has to do with algorithms like belief propagation and so on, but I'll not say so much about that. Um, so <clears throat> this is a picture of Giorgio Parisi, an Italian physicist, and this is one of my favorite uh, pictures. Uh, yes, he's, he looks so happy here. <laughs> he has computed something. Uh, so if you look at the blackboard, uh, there are some nice uh, computations there. And uh, so he, what he's talking about is the minimum matching problem, actually. And uh, if you look here, there's some number that comes out of these calculations. And it's pi squared over 12. And they even has three digits there. Uh, and what this is, is the limit costs of minimum matching on the complete graph with uh, uh, uniform 0, 1 edge costs. So what happens is that there's no renormalization needed. You can just look at the, the cost because as the number of vertices grows, uh, the typical edges in the minimum solution will be uh, cheaper. So, so the cost uh, actually concentrates at this limit value. So this is uh, basically what I like about this uh, model compared to uh, some spatial models that uh, we don't just prove uh, um, concentration or tail bounds or convergence or uh, scaling windows or anything like that. We actually get answers like pi squared over 12 and so on. And uh, this so, so this was in 1986, I think, and this was proved rigorously by David uh, something like 15 years later. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention some, some of these limits that have been established for various problems. So matching pi squared over 12. Uh, spanning tree was proved by Alan Fries already in the 80s. Then the limit is zeta of 3, the Riemann zeta function. Um, the traveling salesman problem, the limit is some number 2.04 and it can be expressed as an integral of a function which, so y is, is a function of x, y is a function of x and uh, it's given by this equation. Uh, so it can be characterized in terms of calculus but it, it's a number that well, it doesn't have a nice name. Um, edge cover. <coughs> there, the limit cost can be most easily described as the half of the minimum of x squared plus e to the minus x, where x goes over all real numbers. Um, and this um, was, I was able to prove this quite recently. I, I, the bipartite case was done in, in joint work with uh, Martin Hessler, who is one of my PhD students. Um, okay, so I'm going to look at uh, some other distributions of edge costs now. So, so if you want to model a d-dimensional space in this mean field model, what you would like to do is to have nearest neighbor distances behave roughly like in uh, d-dimensional space. So the probability that an edge length is shorter than a given small number r should be proportional to r to the d when, when r is uh, going to zero. And one way of doing this is to take, so if I want dimension d, I take the length to be n is the number of points here, uh, times an exponential one variable, and then take the dth root of this. It turns out that this will satisfy this requirement. So this is a simple model of d-dimensional space. But of course, in this complete graph, all distances are independent. So there's no way of assigning a geometry to it. It doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality and so on. Um, and this factor n, what it does is that um, it's like taking the unit of distance to be the distance at which your expected number of neighbors is 1. 
So if you look from a particular vertex and, and what neighbors you have within distance one, the expected number is one. And with this rescaling, we expect the typical edges and the solutions to these optimization problems to be of order one. Uh, so here's a theorem. For d at least equal to one, the cost of perfect matching, and now we rescale by dividing by n, converges in probability to some number which depends on d. And so for d equals one, this is pi squared over 12. And for d larger d, uh, well, it's, it's some number that occurs as some solution to some integral equation. I'll show you later if I have time. This exponential assumption is key. It depends on more than just the behavior near zero. No. <coughs> it's the behavior near zero that, that's relevant. Because if n is large, but thanks for the question. If n is large, we will only be using extremely cheap edges. So it's, it's just a simple way of, of getting this d-dimensional behavior. But really, at the large scale, it doesn't matter uh, the details of this distribution. Uh, and then the corresponding statement for the TSP. Um, OK, so, um, so there's some kind of deeper meaning to this that it's not just that I, I get convergence to some number, but it's also that this replica symmetric predictions are somehow proved to be correct. Um, but I'm not going to tell you exactly what these predictions are. It's a bit complicated. Um, anyway, so here's a two-person game, which has some connection to minimum matching. Um, so there are two players, which are called Alice and Bob. And they take turns choosing the edges of a self-avoiding walk. So there's a given starting point, And there's also some parameter theta, which is greater than 0, that has something to do with. So these results were for, for the complete bipartite graph? Or for the um, what I'm talking about here is the complete graph. Yes, the complete graph. Oh, for, from the teaser yesterday, no? The previous slide. Just the previous slide. The for the, uh, the complete graph. The complete graph. But they actually hold also for the bipartite case. So if we go back to the previous slide, um, if you take the bipartite graph, there'd be a, a factor of two because you have uh, twice as many edges compared to how many neighbors you have. Uh, so um, it doesn't really matter if, if you take the complete bipartite or complete graph with this approach. Um, OK, so, so um, Alice and Bob are playing this game. Uh, so what you do when it's your turn is you choose an edge and you pay the length of that edge to the opponent. OK? Or you finish the game by paying this uh, prescribed penalty for, for quitting. So it's theta over 2. And the reason I say theta over 2 is that it means that edges that are longer than theta are irrelevant. Because if you play according to an edge which is longer than theta, then it would definitely have been better to quit the game. Because even if, well, if the opponent quits right after, then you would have been in better shape if you quit yourself. OK, so um, if they play this game, then they will start here, and Alice chooses this red edge, and then Bob goes from there to a new vertex, and so on. So they, they take turns choosing this path. And then at some point, the game stops. So in this case, it would be Alice who makes the last move, and Bob then chooses to quit, because there was no short enough edge from this vertex. So he, he, quit the game. And the payoff then is the sum of all these payments. So the, the payments of the edges and then this penalty for, for um, uh, quitting the game. It doesn't have to be because there was no cheap edge for him to play immediately, right? It might be just because he looked ahead and realized right. it wasn't worth his <clears throat> Right. So, yes. So if you, if you look ahead, you, 
could perhaps see that in a million moves or so, I would be in trouble, so I better quit right now. Okay. <laughs> um, and here's another optimization problem. So now I'm going to give away the solution to this game. So it's called the, I call it the diluted matching problem. So instead of looking at perfect matching, I want a partial matching. So I choose any set of edges that have no vertex in common. So it could be the empty set, could be a perfect matching. And the cost of this partial matching is the total length of the edges plus the punishment of theta over 2 for each vertex that I leave out. So in this setting, uh, for each value of theta, there's an optimum solution. And it doesn't matter whether n is even or odd. There are always feasible solutions. Um, Okay, so now the solution to the game is the following. So suppose we fix all the parameters of the game, and then we let, so here's some notation, let m of g be the cost of this diluted matching problem, and let f of g and v be Bob's payoff. So Bob's goes seconds. Bob's payoff under optimal play if you start from v. So here's the dilemma. This payoff under optimal play is the difference of the cost of the diluted matching problem in G and in G with the starting point removed. Okay, um, and this is quite easy to prove. So the proof goes like this. So for F, which is a payoff in the game, we can write down a recursion. Um, so here. We take the minimum, so we look at Bob's payoff. So Bob's payoff is the minimum over all move options by Alice. So Alice makes a move. She either quits right away, in case the payoff is theta over 2, or she chooses an edge of length Li that goes to a vertex Vi. And then her payoff in the rest of the game will be f of g minus the starting point, because you can't go back there. And the new game starts at Vi. And this, there's a minus sign because Bob's payoff is, is minus that. Okay. Uh, and on the other hand, this cost of the diluted matching problem also satisfies some recursion, uh, where you look at the vertex V and what you do with it. Either you pay the punishment plus what it costs you to match the rest of the graph, or you match it to one of its neighbors. And then you have to pay the cost of the diluted matching problem in, in the remaining graph here. Okay, so if we look at this and we subtract uh, this term from both sides because we want to obtain this, then uh, we see that we can subtract this in here and, and uh, if we put the parenthesis here, we can write it with a minus sign here because, well, minus and minus is plus, and then <laughs> Uh, and then we see that these two things here, which I claim to be equal, they satisfy the same recursion, actually. So it follows by induction that they are equal. Okay. Uh, so what this means is that if we look at the game under optimal play, then this path will describe uh, the symmetric difference between the optimum diluted matchings on G and G minus the starting point. And also, uh, the moves of the players are, so, so if, if you play this game, if you go first, you should just solve the diluted matching problem on the whole graph and then play according to that, which means that uh, as long as you're at a vertex which is matched in this uh, matching, you play a, a, according to that matching and when you reach a vertex which is not covered by the matching, you quit. Matching over game. You mean when I <laughs> when I came up with this? Yeah. Um, so, I, well, it's a good question. So, what I I was actually looking at the paper, which had to do with the analysis of computer algorithms for games like chess and so on, and I found an equation which looked very similar to uh, an equation that I'd seen in David Elder's paper on on this pi squared over 6 limit, which I recognized from the physics papers. Um, so somehow I thought that there should be a, a formulation of this 
replica symmetric ansets in terms of games. And then I uh, came up with this game, which was described by this equation. And uh, then I realized that the game could be solved in terms of matching theory. So I sort of got back to optimal matchings. And, and so actually, the, I came up with the game first. <laughs> OK. Um, so the Poisson weighted infinite tree is introduced by David. Um, so this is um, another random structure, random process, which goes like this. That's a root. And each vertex in this tree has infinitely many children. And there's a cost for each edge. And from a given vertex, the costs to its children are given by a, a Poisson point process on the positive real line. So, so the first cheapest edge to a child is exponential 1. And then the increments are independent exponentials. And then this goes on recursively. So each, each uh, vertex on the next level has its own children and so on. Um, and uh, so I look at what I call a theta cluster, which means take away all edges that cost more than theta. So what remains then is the Galton-Watson process with costs on the edges and Poisson theta distributed offspring. And uh, I'd like to play this game on, on the theta cluster, a graph exploration game. Um, so why is this? Well, th this Poisson weighted infinite tree, the PWIT, is in some sense a local weak limit of the mean field model. And there's a simple way of making this precise, namely the following. If we look at, so I'm, I want to compare this uh, Poisson weighted infinite tree with the mean field model, which is Kn, and I pick a root at random in Kn. And then I look at uh, what I call uh, k theta neighborhoods, which means that I have the right to go k steps, and each edge should have cost at most theta. And then I look at the neighborhood, which I can reach uh, in that way. And then I claim that there is, exists a coupling of the PWIT and this mean field model, which is such that uh, if I look at the roots, the probability that their k theta neighborhoods are isomorphic, meaning that they, they look the same and the ed all edges have the same cost, this probability is at least this number. So you see, if, if I fix theta and then let n be large, this will be close to 1. Okay, so what it means is if I ask some question which depends only on the k theta neighborhood, then I can approximate the mean field model by the PWIT. Dimension yes, thanks for that question. And then, of course, if I want to do this in pseudo dimension d, then if you rem remember how I chose these distances, you can just take the PWIT and then take the dth root of all the edge costs, and you get a similar model of the d dimensional mean field model. Um, but actually, what I'm going to talk about in the rest of this talk, it doesn't really depend on D. So you can think of D as being equal to 1, if you like, or, uh, yeah, right. Um, so anyway, so what this means is I want to study this game, graph exploration, on the PWIT. Um, and then the problem is, of course, that theta cluster can be infinite. And I haven't said anything about how the game is played. I mean, the game is well defined. You can play it. But what happens if the game just goes on forever? There's no well defined outcome. So I can't even define optimal play unless I know what the outcome is and, and so on. So I get into some situation where it's not really clear what, what the players want to achieve. Uh, but what you can do is to look at what I call optimistic k look ahead values. So what you do is you look k moves ahead. And then you just assume that if the game ever reaches this far without anyone quitting, then uh, I will be in good shape. So the, the opponent will pay me theta over 2 right away, because I, I just assume that everything will be as good as, as it can be uh, when I 
when I'm behind the, the horizon, so to speak. Um, and then, um, so this this would give a, a, a well-defined strategy, of course. I can I can play according to this strategy. Um, but what I want to do here is to then let k go to infinity, so that I get two uh, different views of the game. One is Bob's view and one is Alice's view. So both of them are optimistic and uh, seem to think that uh, at, at infinity, so to speak, uh, they will be rewarded in some sense. So uh, related in some way to having a discount factor is the factor of purchase one or zero. And you could also play with an infinite time horizon with the discount factor. With a discount factor, so that the money you make, money in k generations time, costs zero to the k. Mm. Uh, maybe I haven't thought of that. Maybe that's another way of, of doing this. Mm. All right. So anyway, what what it boils down to is I I want to. So I, we get these infinite look ahead values, which are, uh, so by f a and f b, I mean, so f is some, in some sense the, the, the value having moved to a certain vertex, uh, which means that it's the same as the value of the game from the second player's point of view if the game would start at that vertex and, and just go down. And uh, I can define this optimistic or pessimistic, if you like, if you see it from the other point of view, uh, values of this game from Alice's and Bob's point of view. And uh, the interesting question is whether these are equal or not. So the theorem is that almost surely these are equal. So this means in some sense that if you put arbitrary values at, at level k moves ahead and then you propagate this upwards and, and get some sort of approximation of the value at the point where you are, then if a k, if you only make k large, it will not matter what you put at, at the case, uh, at the horizon, so to speak. Uh, what you get here it will be roughly the same anyway. So, uh, uh, so the sketch of proof here is that, suppose these are not equal, then we can let Alice and Bob play this game optimistically. So we just pit two optimistic players against each other. And of course, if they don't agree on the value of the root, then uh, nobody can terminate the game because both will think that they will be better off than what the opponent thinks. So the game will go on forever. Um, now, so this is something I'd like to take a couple of minutes to explain. So now, Let's look at it from the Bob's point of view. So Bob has this view of the values of the vertices of the quit of the theta cluster. And when, when Alice and Bob play this game, Bob will think that he plays optimally. And from his point of view, he will perceive it as if Alice possibly at some points makes mistakes. So Alice would play according to her view of, of the value um, and from Bob's point of view, he will see it as if he gets some sort of advantages that, that uh, accumulate. Uh, and each time Alice makes a move which is not according to Bob's, uh, what he thinks is optimal, um, there's a simple way of quantifying how, how far it is from being optimal. It just sum the, the costs that are actually being paid and, and with the difference of the, the values of these vertices. So, so there's, there's a certain amount, each time Alice makes what Bob will think is a mistake, there's a certain amount of, um, there's a certain how far it is from being optimal from Bob's point of view. And uh, the sum of all these mistakes cannot be arbitrarily large because if that would be much larger than theta, then Bob could, so to speak, cash his, his uh, gain by, by terminating the game and, and get an off, a payoff which is better than Alice would have thought from the start that it would be. So, 
is this somehow? Uh, you look a little bit suspicious here. <laughs> Maybe I didn't <laughs> explain this very well. Uh, by terminating the game. So if, if Bob thinks that Alice had, had, has made all these mistakes that have given him uh, a billion dollars, well, it depends on what theta is, but has given him uh, more than theta, uh, more than what he was supposed to get, then he could terminate, even if this would not be optimal from his point of view, he could terminate and reach a payoff which is better for him than FA. Uh, by, by terminating even when he thinks he shouldn't, he's, it's only costing him theta. Yes. And he's already been given two yes. theta. Yes. So the point is that these mistakes will add up to some finite amount. So that means that eventually in this game, which goes on forever, after a while, Alice will make no large mistakes. All her mistakes will be very, very small. And so let's say that a move is delta reasonable if it's within delta of being optimal. Okay? Then uh, we can look at this as a branching process. We look at all the optimal moves and all Alice's delta reasonable moves. So, so delta reasonable means that it's not necessarily optimal, but if you look at this value from Bob's point of view, uh, this move is, if you, so if you look at the length of the edge minus this f of, of the next vertex, it's within delta of the optimal thing. Yes. Um, so if we look at this branching process where... Optimal strategies from now on, so you're considering um, he makes a move and he's looking at it as if from now on he's going to play, they're, they're both going to play optimally and you're measuring the delta. I, I, the I, just, I just look at this from Bob's point of view, from yeah. Bob's optimistic point of view. So there's a function fb that gives a value to each vertex, which so is the, just the delta of that function. I mean, the delta is some, some number which is positive and, yeah, and this, this is... I said delta. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm not sure. I okay. Um, so the point here is that if we just choose delta small enough, then the branching due to these delta reasonable moves will not be able to counter the the, the effect of. of the, the fact that the game terminates at certain points, whenever you reach a point which, which has value theta over 2. So this will involve some, some computation that I will not show you, but perhaps you can believe this, since we can pick delta as small as we please. So given theta, we choose some delta, which is extremely small, so that this branching effect uh, is cancelled, so that the, the, these delta reasonable lines do not percolate. The, so the, the lines of play that we must consider is just some finite thing. Um, so then that actually gives a contradiction because if the probability that uh, F A is equal to F of B, um, if, if that's not one, I mean either it's one or it's somewhere between 0 and 1, and it's the same everywhere in the tree, so um, if, if, if you cannot have this infinite delta reasonable paths uh, anywhere in the tree, then you, 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 cannot, uh, you cannot have f a equal to, uh, different from f of b. Um, okay, so what does this mean in terms of optimum matchings and so on? Well, it means that uh, what the physicists would call replica symmetry holds. It means something like this. If we look at the complete graph on n vertices, and now n is some enormous number. <coughs> so it's like, well, theta is large, and then n is exponential in theta. Uh, and we have some vertex v in this graph. Uh, what this uh, means is that if you look at the diluted matching problem, then with high probability, we can decide what to do with this vertex v 
by just looking at some neighborhood which is big O1. Well, it depends on theta, but not on n. Um, so by just looking at this game, because if the game terminates within this neighborhood, then we know what to do with V in the optimum diluted matching. And this is precisely what we need to prove in order to prove that these costs converge as n goes to infinity, because it means that, uh, well, essentially the average cost of an edge in the solution will not depend on n. So. Might call measurability. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess. Um, okay, so this is so what we arrive at is this that for each theta, the cost of this diluted matching problem converges in this sense in probability to something which depends on theta. But of course, this is increasing with theta, and actually. It's not hard to show that it's upper bounded. So it has a limit. And then we have to show in some way, uh, which is non trivial, but anyway, it's, it's not that hard. Uh, so the, the proof of this convergence of perfect matching involves uh, interchanging the limits. So we let n tend to infinity, and at the same time, theta tends to infinity, and we have to show that somehow it doesn't matter in which order we do this. Um, but this can be done. Um, so I already mentioned this result. This was David's result. Uh, and also, so for d equals 2, I made some numeric integration and got some decimals. So this is... Uh, well, this is just some number, but at least I can prove convergence and probability to this number. And for the TSP, this is this uh, limit cost. Now, I didn't tell you how to get these results for the TSP, but there's an, a, a game associated to the traveling salesman problem as well. Um, so, now, refusal chess. <clears throat> so, uh, refusal chess is a chess variant which I think has been played, it was invented somehow in the 50s, I think, has been played uh, at you know, chess. It's quite, well, not well known perhaps, but well. Uh, people have actually played this game. Uh, so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so the rules are as follows. Uh, when you make a move, or you, when you want to make a move, you, you, you make the move and then your opponent has the right to forbid one move. So if your opponent doesn't like this move, he or she will say, no, you have to take back that. You have to do an, make another move. And you make another move, and the opponent does not have to, the right to refuse more than once per turn, but uh, you know, one refusal per move. So, for instance, in this position, so this is a position which uh, arised in a, a game of uh, Jonathan Yedidia, who was in the, well, he was at the conference, he was not in the audience of my talk, but he was at the conference where I gave this talk last time. Uh, so, uh, suppose that Black would play this move. Uh, this is actually a quite strong move in ordinary chess. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, yes, so here it goes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Now, if white doesn't like this move, he will say, no, to make another move. So it moves back this bishop, and black has to play another move. So let's say, captures this pawn of the queen. Now, white doesn't have the right to refuse another time, so now it's white's turn. So let's suppose that white makes this move, captures this bishop with his queen. Now in ordinary chess, this would perhaps not be a very good move because black can just take back here. And of course, in refusal chess, it's not, it's not obvious. Um, so now black can either accept this move or, or refuse it. And suppose black 
accepts it, then black can, well, let's say black gives a check here, it looks very dangerous. Now white's problem is, of course, that if he refuses this move by black, then black can capture white's queen here, and so on. So I'm not going to analyze this position <laughs> in, in detail. This is just to give you some idea of this game. Okay, so this is similar to a game that we can call my tour is better than yours. So suppose Alice and Bob play a game where we assume that for some reason Bob is claiming that this edge, which goes from, so you can think of this as being some large graph and this is uh, some sub-graph where, where Alice and Bob are fighting over who, uh, who's, who has the best traveling salesman tour. Uh, now, uh, just a warning, I'm going to sweep some details under the rug here, so, so don't ask too many detailed questions about this. Anyway, so for some reason, Bob says that this is a good edge to use in a traveling salesman tour, and Alice says, no, it's not. So, Alice says that, no, well, I use this edge instead. Okay, well, the difference is that in the traveling salesman problem, each vertex has two edges. So, if Bob says, I'm going to use this edge, and, and Alice says, uh, well, I'm going to use this one, then Bob actually has the option to say that, okay, good, but I also use this. Okay, so then we have some sort of cancellation here, that they agree on using this edge in their tours, but they still fight over whether this edge was good or not. So Bob has said that I'm going to use these two edges, and Alice has only said that she use this one. So Bob then asks, okay, so what, what else are you going to do with this vertex? Because this vertex has to have two edges from it. So Alice says, okay, I'll use this edge instead. Uh, now Bob, of course, cannot use this edge because he has already said that he is using these two edges. So Bob has to use some other edge from this vertex. So Bob says, okay, I'll use this edge. And Alice just says, okay, good for you, but so do I. Okay, now it's roads are reversed. So now Alice has two edges to this vertex, and Bob only has one. And Bob does not have the right to use this one. So Alice can ask Bob, okay, what are you going to do with this vertex? Because you only have one edge here. And Bob goes, okay, I, I use this edge, and so on. So what happens here is that it's like graph exploration, but with this refusal option. So each time a player makes a move, the other one can refuse it once or accept it. Uh, so, if Alison says this move, well, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Bob can either accept or refuse it. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to say anything more about the TSP now because everything is basically similar to the, to the matching problem. You analyze this game and get this replica symmetry and convergence in probability to, to some limits. Um, what I haven't told you about is how to actually get from this fa equals fb to these limit constants. So now I thought maybe I have some, a few minutes left. I can show you a little toy example uh, where you can actually work out quite easily the, the resulting computation. So this is a, a a quite simple problem, edge cover on the real line. So suppose we have the real line and some random point set. So let's say Poisson process uh, rate one. And what we want to do is to find edges between this that cover all vertices. So you can think of this as a street where people live and we have to uh, construct some telephone uh, connections and something like that. And the recurrent is that Everybody should have someone to, to speak to. So each one should be connected to either the right or left neighbor. So a solution perhaps looks like this. So uh, we, we, we want to use short edges, of course, so this looks okay. Uh, but then if we have, for instance, three vertices quite close to each other, perhaps we want to use both edges adjacent to this vertex and so on. So it's, we'd like to, it's going to be roughly a matching, but at some points we want to use both 
edges adjacent to a certain point. Okay, um, so if we use our friends Alice and Bob now, let's say that Bob is going to use this particular edge and Alice isn't. Okay, um, so what happens then is that we can look at how much Bob gains from using this edge. So without looking at the length of this edge, just ask what's, what's Bob's advantage on the right hand side and on the left hand side respectively. So, so if let f then be Bob's gain from using this particular edge in the right hand side of, of this uh, line, then this is of course, well, Bob can always say that he will use the same cover as Alice on this side, so it's at least zero. Bob can always cancel Alice's moves. Uh, otherwise, because Alice has to use this edge, and if Bob finds that uh, maybe he doesn't want to use this edge, then he can let uh, he can try to obtain an advantage here by by uh, uh, so so Bob's advantage will be the cost of, of of this edge, which I call x. It's an exponential then minus f1, where this f1 is distributed uh, as f. So this is Alice's gain from using this edge compared to Bob in, in covering the rest of the line here. Okay. So, so, so. so you understand what is the gain? Yes. yes. So uh, now that we have this equation, we can interpret it, this as a game where, so the game is played on, say, the right hand side of this edge. And uh, no, but, but, but sort of no. maybe before that, what's the definition of F? I mean, what do you mean by Bob's gain? Oh, uh, okay, so we're talking about, okay, so the line is infinite, so we can't really talk about total length. Yeah. But uh, um, um, if Bob is using this edge and Alice is not, then the optimal thing, now I run into some vicious circle of, how to define things, but <laughs> in the optimal edge cover, uh, eventually they will become equal at some point here. Uh, uh, I'm sure you <laughs> believe this deep in your hearts, but uh, <laughs> um, so. <laughs> you mean the optimal edge cover that uses this one and the optimal one that doesn't use it? Yes. Um, and the game is so Bob says, I'm going to use this edge, and then Alice says, okay, then I'm going to use this one. And then Bob can either, after that, either uh, say that, okay, I, I too uh, use this edge. And then they have reached some sort of equilibrium where the rest of their covers must be equal. Or he says, I'm, I'm not going to use this edge, I'm going to use this one instead. And then Alice has the option of saying, okay, I'm going to use this too. The game stops or going on and say, no, I'm going to use this one instead. Uh, <laughs> In this specific case, can the game be analyzed by uh, analyzing the uh, corresponding dynamic program? I mean, you, you start a cover, and mm -hmm. you cover the first endpoint, and the, the endpoint is either covered from the left or not. Mm -hmm. and then if yeah. you continue, you have just two states, and Yes. There is some distribution of what the yes. cost of the next two states. So we can probably. Yes. So, um, in an attempt to sort of cancel uh, Andrew's question here, and say that in this case it's not clear what the point is in looking at it as, as a game, but we reach this kind of equation which would arise also from, from the game point of view. Uh, anyway, so uh, from this equation we can just sort of untangle the distribution of this f. Um, well, so the, fr from here we get the probability that f is larger than some fixed number 
is equal to the, if this number is greater than zero, then we only look at this thing. So then essentially we have that f is distributed like x minus f where x is exponential. And this is, well, quite straightforward calculation. Uh, I think you believe me if I say that from this you can work out what the unique solution is. So actually, uh, well, let me skip this calculation details of it. But it can, turns out that the probability that f is greater than some number t, if t is greater than zero, is two thirds of e to the minus t. So this uh, Bob's advantage. If you like, you can think of this as we take the limit. We 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 look at a finite line, but a very long one. And and then we look at what's what's how much does Bob gain from using this edge if we compare how Alice and Bob's, uh, how they cover the rest of the vertices here. Then this will be zero with probability one third, and with probability two thirds, it would be just an exponential. Uh, okay. So then the question is, when does Bob, when, when does this edge actually belong to the optimum cover? So the point is, it does if it's smaller than what, what uh, uh, Bob will gain. So if, if his cost of using this edge is smaller than what he will gain from the left hand and from the right hand side, then, it's, then his, his cover is better than Alice's and vice versa. Uh, and if we know the distribution of F1 and F2, they are independent copies of this uh, distribution, then we can just compute what this thing is. So it turns out that the probability of using a particular edge a priori without conditioning on its cost is 5 over 9. And if you look at the expectation of the contribution of this edge, so its cost times the um, indicator variable of, of, of it appearing in the optimum cover is one third. So the conclusion would be then that the optimum solution covers one third of the real line and that one vertex out of nine is connected to both its left and right neighbors. Um, so in, in, in this mean field model, this is also what uh, kind of condition that occurs, that an edge is used if its cost is cheaper than the sum of two independent samples from the game theoretical value of the corresponding game. Uh, okay, I think uh, this is about it. Uh, some comments on future work. Well, of course, there are some technical th reasons why I haven't been able to prove these things for d between 0 and 1, but there's no reason to think it shouldn't work, so this is something I'd like to do. Um, Inventing games for other optimization problems. This would be very interesting for problems like uh, graph coloring, K set, and so on, where replica symmetry is known not to hold. So I don't know what the results would be, but maybe there's some, some way of. So um, belief propagation. And also, I'd like to um, talk at some point to people here about something called social networks. Um, I, I don't think I'll go into that now. Uh, computer analysis and games, of course. So this is, so replica symmetry uh, seems to be somehow linked to, to this uh, idea that you can play a game efficiently by looking k moves ahead if k is some large number. So you'd think then that games like chess where computers now beat any human being, uh, they sort of represent this case of symmetry while there are other games that are more difficult where you have some sort of long-term uh, factors that are invisible to a fixed depth <coughs> search. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, this, this chess problem. So this chess problem is, uh, there are two versions of it. Uh, and two different solutions. So if someone is interested in this, uh, go ahead. Uh, so it's a mate in two in ordinary chess, and then there's a different solution in 
repeaters of chess. Okay, thank you very much. So are you constructing a different interpretation of the word replica? Or can you tell us, can you build a bridge stronger back to the physics and make the connection in some form of words to what the physicists are doing? Um, I mean, if you took replica symmetry entirely out of your lecture, it would be a perfectly good lecture. So I don't quite understand what replica symmetry has to do with it. But maybe I don't know what physics of replica symmetry is. Okay, I, so I, I use this in order to, to um, uh, more or less, invite people in the audience to <laughs> answer <laughs> questions like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, Okay, so if I go back to um, this picture, let me see where it was. Okay, it was right back here. Uh, here. Okay, so this is the sort of essence of it, that, uh, that uh, what you do to a certain vertex, if you solve this optimization problem, you can work it out by just looking uh, at a close neighborhood. And, uh, well, this is some kind of symmetry. <laughs> but it's but it's only you want to know what happens to within some small f. Right? Yes. Right, so, I mean, sort of, if it was an infinite thing, then that's just saying that the value you're interested in is measurable with respect to this yes. data. It's, yes. it's a function of it, rather than... Uh, Given the data, the edgenex or whatever, there's some sort of more than one possible value. Yes. So um, if you look at the physics literature, uh, there's some introduction that talks about magnetization and temperature and uh, a lot of other things that I don't understand. And then suddenly there are some equations. And uh, <laughs> if, you, if you then try to understand how to justify these equations, it's something like this, that you, you want this to behave like uh, some physical system, that if you add something down here, it shouldn't affect, well, it should be extremely unlikely that it, it has a global effect. This is a cavity. Uh, is it? No. <laughs> 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 okay. So, so where's the replica? I mean, uh, asking anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where's the replica? Somehow you you imagine building two copies of this whole system. Is yes. where the edge cups or whatever they are are the same. Yes. Is, but otherwise there's sort of independent condition on that and you ask whether the Yes, uh, it's like if you have the same one. if you have one of them over here and the other replica at the other side of the room and and the, the temperature and so on is slightly different. Will will you get the same solution or not? Uh, something like that. <laughs> <laughs>